A promising young family in Bakersfield, California. A newborn and two toddlers. Their parents, pillars of the local school district. On a beautiful July morning, the family ventured out in their Sunday best to introduce their newest addition to their congregation. But someone else had a much different mission that weekend. How did the morning begin with a celebration and end with a family massacre. This is the case of Vincent Brothers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Crime Cave. I'm Christy, and I distinctly remember hearing about this case about 15 years ago, and it really intrigued me, uh, not only the the tragedy of the case, but the science that was used in order to solve it. So we are going to learn about Vincent Brothers, but more importantly, let's learn about the Harper family. Joni Harper was born November 14, 1963. She grew up in a modest and respected family. They were active in the community and were very religious. Joni was described as multi-talented and a star basketball player in high school. She went on to become a Division I women's basketball official. Joni had worked as campus supervisor for the Bakersfield City School District since 1994 and was responsible for campus security and safety. Joni's mother, Ernestine Harper, was born March 27, 1933 and was an outspoken and fearless community activist. She fought for people who she believed were unjustly accused and had recently worked for a defendant in a high-profile murder case. Joni was also involved in her community. The Harpers lived in a tough neighborhood, and she spent time working with troubled children. It was through the Bakersfield City School District that Joni met Vincent Brothers, vice principal at Fremont Elementary. Vincent was born May 31, 1962, and grew up as one of 11 children by a single mother in Long Island, New York. As a young adult, Vincent made his way to California and began his career in education. He was known as a stern leader who mixed encouragement and discipline in daily lessons to young people about how to survive in tough neighborhoods. Vincent was described as sort of a Pied Piper that kids gravitated toward him and that when he was around, kids would run out like he was the ice cream man. Joni and Vincent became quite the team in their school district and were considered pillars of the community. News stations would do stories on the couple, as he was known as the caring vice principal, and cameras would follow the couple, escorting students home on their bicycles. Vice Principal Vincent Brothers and Joni Harper, who is the campus supervisor, are escorting students home on wheels. That's <laughs> cool we ever had. And he was there with his wife in our stories, riding the brand new bikes and thanking the community for doing that for him. I'm excited. I really appreciate it. Um, I didn't expect this. And thank you. How about you? It's a bit overwhelming, but we appreciate their support. That they've given us uh, the years that we've been here. And so it's just an opportunity for us to show that we care and make sure their, their children get home safely. According to Joni's brother, Eddie, Vincent was the love of her life. He said, we knew she was deeply in love with this man. But to say they had an on-again, off-again relationship would be an understatement. Joni gave birth to their first child, a son, Marcus Harper, on November 15, 1998. Marcus was later described as smart, handsome, very well-mannered, and full of life. Much to their family's relief, the couple decided to finally marry in January of 2000, and Joni was reportedly excited and nervous to move in with Vincent at his large house after their marriage. Apparently, she had reason to be nervous. They formally separated less than two weeks later. On the paperwork, Joni checked the box nullification based on fraud as the reason she wanted a divorce 
because Vincent neglected to mention to Joni that he had been married and divorced twice before. He also had a habit of disappearing for three days at a time, but would not tolerate being questioned about it. Speaking of his previous relationships, let's backtrack for a moment. Vincent lived with a woman named Shan Kern while they were both students at Cal State Bakersfield, and they had a child together in 1988, a daughter they named Margaret. However, Shan dared to confront him about one of his disappearances, and Vincent was ultimately convicted of spousal abuse and spent a few days in jail. This is what Shan had to say. I was in love with Vincent. I, I loved him. I, I admired him. I had little slippers on, and, and I had a little fuzzy slipper. And I picked that thing up, and I said, Vincent, you can't treat me like this. Man, when that slipper hit him, he just, boom, 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 jumped on me and just started beating me like I would, like he didn't even know me. Did Like he didn't know me, just kept, wow, wow. Every time I would get up, he would hit me. Uh, a complete different person than what you were really dealing with and just had this most evil face scared to live in life out of me vincent's second marriage broke up under similar circumstances with that wife stating he threatened to kill me turns out his disappearances were covers for serial infidelity and most people weren't aware of vincent's jekyll and hyde personality Joni and Vincent continued their occasional involvement, and she gave birth to their second child later that same year, on August 5th, 2000, a daughter named Lindsay, who was later described as smart, beautiful, and full of life. The couple decided to remarry in January of 2003, but by April, Vincent moved out of the family home yet again reportedly due to discord between him and his mother-in-law, Ernestine, who lived with them. Joni would give birth to their third child a month later, a son they named Marshall. Michelle Baptiste, Joni's friend of 11 years, had been invited to the second wedding, but didn't go. She said, I told her I didn't think it was one of her better decisions. On July 2, 2003, Vincent flew to Columbus, Ohio to visit his brother Melvin for several days. He rented a Dodge Neon and then drove to North Carolina to visit his mother, Margaret. Meanwhile, back in Bakersfield, the Harper family, Joni, her three children, and her mother, spent the morning of July 6 showing off baby Marshall to church members for the first time and then enjoying a holiday barbecue with friends including Joni's best friend, Kelsey Spann. The family then went home to rest until evening services. But they never made it to those services. After her phone calls to Joni went unanswered for two days, Kelsey went to the home on Tuesday, July 8th. What she found was a house of horrors. The 911 call came in just after 7 a.m. <laughs> Upon entering the home, police first found Ernestine. She had been shot twice in the face at close range and was laying in the hallway near her bedroom. In another bedroom, police found the bodies of Joni and the three children still laying in the same spots they had lain Sunday to nap after church. Joni was found on her bed. She had been shot at least twice in the head and once in the arm. The killer then stabbed her seven times, mostly in the back. She was found on her side with her arms curled up over her face. Two-year-old Lindsay was found on her left side at the foot of the bed in her little blue dress. She had a single gunshot wound to the back. Four-year-old Marcus was beside his mother on the bed and was covered by a sheet. Police theorized that he woke up before the murders. He was found with his eyes open and a gunshot wound to the right side of his head. He had been so frightened before his death 
that he had bitten his right hand down to the bone. Baby Marshall was thought to be missing, but after further searching, he was found under a pillow near his mother. The infant had been shot in the back. Police tracked down Vincent at his mother's home in North Carolina. Given the fact that he was the estranged husband, Vincent was arrested as a suspect. Less than 12 hours later, he was released due to lack of evidence. Detectives continued their investigation, and Vincent was rearrested almost 10 months later, with the case finally going to trial in 2007. Defense attorney Michael Gardena claimed Vincent had been halfway across the country the entirety of the long holiday weekend his family was murdered, and he had credit card receipts to prove it. Gardena also floated the theory that perhaps Ernestine's very public community activism drew animosity and that she, in fact, was the intended target. But the defense primarily focused on the physical improbability that Vincent would have been able to drive almost 2,300 miles from Ohio to California in two days. Vincent maintained that although he put approximately 5,400 miles on the rented Dodge Neon, He testified he had never left the eastern part of the country. Prosecutor Lisa Green, however, ultimately proved that Vincent lied on the stand 41 times. Regarding the credit card usage in Columbus, closer examination of those receipts and surveillance footage revealed that it was actually Vincent's brother Melvin that signed for those purchases. Initially, Melvin lied when confronted about it but later admitted he had done so at Vincent's urging. Furthermore, a glove tip containing Brother's DNA was found underneath the upturned purse of Joni Harper by investigators shortly following the slayings. A neighbor in Harper's neighborhood testified as an eyewitness, stating she saw Vincent near the patio door of the Harper home around the time of the murders. But the nail in the coffin was the testimony from Lynn Kimsey, a bug expert from UC Davis Bohart Museum of Entomology, specializing in California species. Upon examination of the rental car, bug parts from species only found west of the Rocky Mountains were discovered lodged in the Dodge Neon's radiator and air filter. But what was the motive of this family massacre? This wasn't a split decision. This wasn't a crime of passion. That drive from Columbus, Ohio to Bakersfield, California took 32 hours. Imagine the focus and the energy it took to make that drive by yourself with no sleep. This man was on a mission. The prosecution alleged that Vincent had carried on several extramarital affairs and that his motive for the killing was greed. Vincent had wanted to relieve himself of the burden of supporting his growing family. On May 2007, Vincent Brothers was found guilty of five counts of first-degree murder in a special circumstance of multiple murders. He was sentenced to death by lethal injection by Judge Michael Bush. However, Governor Gavin Newsom has suspended the death penalty for as long as he remains in office. In a dramatic courtroom statement, Brothers' only surviving child, Margaret Kern Brothers, who was 18 at the time of the trial, gave a powerful statement. She said she was resigning from the brother's family and that after she walked out of the courtroom, she would forever be Margaret Kern. She said her father was now just a man handcuffed to a chair. Vincent Brothers remains in San Quentin to this day. Thanks for joining me. This episode of Crime Cave has been brought to you by Fortress Defense Consultants, providing security consulting for educational institutions, corporate facilities, and houses of worship, as well as pepper spray, situational awareness, and defensive firearms training for police and private citizens. Find Fortress on the web at fortressdefense.com. Contact Fortress directly at 708-522-8060 or email them at info at fortressdefense.com. Avoid being the subject of a future episode of Crime Cave. Train with Fortress today. Until next time.